Welcome back to this lecture on the anti-war movement of the 1960s. Now, the anti-war movement of the 1960s uh, began about 1965, and by that time, the new left had had enough success um, with its 1964 free speech campaign that it had organized uh, particularly SDS chapters across the, the universities of, um, of the United States. Now, the anti-war movement tended to be centered in universities because of the draft. Um, one of the things that occurred was that draft age men, and the draft really began affecting 20-year-olds, 21-year-olds, then 19-year-olds, then 18-year-olds um, in that order, um, began in earnest as we began um, escalating the war in Vietnam. And one of the ways to avoid the draft was to get a college deferment. And that is, if you could go to college, then you were relieved of having to go to the draft. And if you've seen Animal House, uh, you'll, there's a scene in which uh, the dean is telling um, these, these ne'er-do-well students that He's not only going to fail them in all of their courses, but he's going to inform their draft board uh, that they are not successful college students. And that is a threat to them uh, to end their college career and make them eligible for the draft. Now, this means a, a couple of different things. That's, that's just a, a silly example. But by, by providing college deferments, that meant that um, – Young men, because women were not involved uh, in the draft, young men could, if they could go to college, then then they could avoid the draft, but also that they were threatened with the draft if they did not do well or when they got out of college. And so um, between SDS having chapters at many schools and the natural exuberance of, uh, of students in mass, um, and the kind of radicalization that was taking place because of culture and um, uh, student politics of the era combined with a very keen focus on ending the war, then college students became the, the carriers of the anti-war movement. That is, that they became the seedbed. Um, of the anti-war movement. So you see a lot of this going on on college campuses. Uh, this is also one of the reasons why so many um, people got graduate degrees, was that there was an incentive to continue going to college uh, in order to make yourself somewhat ineligible for military service. Um, the anti-war movement got, a, a, got its real start um, with when the, the, the Operation Rolling Thunder began in 1965, um, and this sparked widespread opposition to escalation of the war in Vietnam. Uh, this, this widespread opposition was not just people grumbling. Um, people on college campuses decided to, quote, unquote, do something about it and began organizing anti-war teach-ins beginning in the spring of 1965 uh, these were modeled on the Freedom Schools, another indirect link between the Civil Rights Movement and the, um, the anti-war New Left um, movements. Um, uh, they began teach-ins in the spring of 1965, and in April of 1965, um, anti-war marchers coming from college campuses marched on Washington. This is the beginning of the era of of large protest marches, including some, uh, lots of small protest marches. Uh, remember, too, that the anti-war movement and the new left were merging together very rapidly. A lot of times, um, uh, th those people motivated by new left ideology were the ones that were most highly motivated against the war. And so um, uh, even before there was widespread antagonism to the war in 1967, 68, um, then the, the, the people that were most seriously involved in pushing the anti-war programs were those who had a, a radical critique of American society and saw that war was just part of what they thought was wrong with the United States. 
Uh, one of the things that you see beginning in 1965 is the establishment of communication systems between and among uh, the cultural radicals, the new left, um, the anti-war movement, and all of the outposts of all of these uh, movements together. So we see the beginning not only of teach-ins on specific campuses, but we see the development of symposia and of information sharing. Uh, particularly, uh, we see manifestations like the creation of systems of news sharing based on uh, how newspapers and televisions operated, where newspapers and televisions had um, the, the AP wire and UPI, United Press International, um, radical underground newspaper producers um, in 1966 created their own news sharing organization called the Underground News Service. And in 1967, a more highly politicized um, group began uh, for, uh, uh, sharing information in their Liberation News Service. Now, look at the two names in the one year that separates them. 1966 Underground News Service, uh, uh, kind of kind of more cultural than political. There's no aim expressed. It's just countercultural. We're underground. Those of us who are in this new uh, culture are sharing um, uh, information about cultural things, about uh, uh, about our, our politics, about our anti-war stance, about uh, other things. But then by 1967, we start seeing kind of a harder edge to this, reflected in the name Liberation News Service. Uh, there's a big difference between underground and liberation, uh, where liberation has a much more um, a, a, a much more political edge to it. Well, about this same time, uh, 66, 67, Martin Luther King uh, begins to reemerge after the victory of the Voting Rights Act. Um, uh, reemerges with a new critique in which he has listened to the civil rights workers. He has listened to um, the new left. He's beginning to look at uh, the war in Vietnam, and he creates, beginning with his Riverside New York church sermon in 1967, a blended critique of American society that includes um, his promotion of civil rights for everyone, his promotion of peace, his critique of American capitalism and American imperialism, all rolled into one, uh, particularly his focus on poverty and peace. Um, and within the, uh, we're, we're talking about anti-war here, and so within the Johnson administration, then um, beginning in 1967, there is some real concern that this war is, is just a major drag on the United States and is unwinnable. And so even people like Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, who had uh, promoted and been the leading cheerleader for escalation in 1965, reversed his course, and Johnson fired Secretary of Defense McNamara for doubting the war in 1967. Now, by March of 1968, um, after Tet, then uh, Johnson himself would doubt the war, but McNamara was just booted, uh, unceremoniously fired by, by a very incensed Johnson in 1967 for seeing the writing on the wall. Well, the anti-war movement beginning on uh, college campuses, um, uh, merging with the new left, uh, merging with the civil rights movement, even infecting the administration, uh, sees a major conflagration in 1968. Um, the Tet Offensive created a new wave of agitation. Uh, student protests, because they had become so politicized, uh, it was impossible to tell the difference between um, uh, between between student anti-war protests and student radicalism protests, um, they became violent and they sparked violent um, uh, suppression. For example, um, there was a massive sit-in that took over the administration building at Columbia University and would not leave. 
thousands of students occupied the administration building, sitting shoulder to shoulder in the hallways, uh, refusing to leave for days at a time. Uh, this sparked a violent uh, assault on the students at Columbia University. Um, the students themselves got violent. They, they were not denizens of nonviolence at that point. They punched back um, instead of sitting there taking it. And um, uh, so there's fighting on both sides. Uh, there were riots at the Democratic National Convention um, uh, in Chicago uh, that led to um, a, a large show trial. Um, it, it led to recriminations. It played badly on the news. Remember, this was only a few years after um, uh, the, the Birmingham problems and civil rights uh, after the Selma to Montgomery March, just a few years. Um, there had been riots every summer, race riots. Uh, there, were, there were political riots uh, across the face of the U.S. And in fact, um, across the world, particularly the Western world, it seemed like revolution uh, in a student worker um, 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 socialist inspired revolution would take over uh, the world. This, of course, did not happen. But in 1968, it seemed like it was about to happen. Um, revolutionary movements sprung up uh, across the Western world. Just about uh, the, the student worker rebellion in France just about toppled the government. Um, and it sure looked like there was going to be some serious problems in the United States in 1968. This is that point at which the, the radical critique of American society, cultural, political, and the anti-war movement and the civil rights movement have all merged together. Um, and have become fairly powerful, at least as a critique, um, if not an actual political force. Well, the height of the anti-war movement, after 1968, the, the anti-war movement um, took the front reins, you might say, um, or the lead, became the lead of the, um, uh, of the student radical movement and tended to replace um, generalized radicalism with focused anti-war radicalism. Um, 1969 to 71 was the height of the anti-war movement, the absolute apogee. And much like SDS had been the leading organization for the new left, uh, in this era, 1969 to 71, the organization known as Student Mobilization, the MOB against the war, um, became the leading uh, edge of anti-war uh, actions, and, and its action primarily was protest marches. Um, we, we see protest marches uh, around the United States that are part of the MOB, uh, the student mobilization against the war. This is not so much a real organization as it is a movement, much like the Civil Rights Movement was a movement. Um, lots of, of little chapters of uh, the student mobilization began springing up, holding their own protest marches. Um, the uh, second uh, anti-war march on Washington occurred in November of 1969, in which 500,000 uh, participants gathered in Washington for um, uh, multi-day uh, marches. Um, when the Nixon administration uh, let it be known that we had invaded Cambodia, then we see anti-Nixon marches in April and May of 1970 to protest the Cambodian invasion. And on May 4th of 1970, uh, in the small college of Kent State in Ohio, um, student protesters facing off against National Guardsmen um, led to a, a shooting um, called the Kent State Massacre, in which four students were shot um, and 11 others wounded. Many of those were, were uh, victims that had nothing to do with the protest, but were in the background because bullets don't, you know, they, they're ballistic. They just fly straight ahead uh, and strike whatever they strike. Um, in, in Jackson, Mississippi, at Jackson State, um, a, a civil rights protest, a small protest, um, a confrontation between black students and white policemen ended with um, uh, a shooting there uh, just a few days later on May 14th and 15th of 1970. And that, that uh, uh, confrontation began as kind of an anti-war 
civil rights protest um, as well. So these two these two shootings sa- uh, share um, some things. Uh, they share some similarities. Um, in 1971, uh, Daniel Ellsberg, um, who had who had been part of the war making establishment at the Rand Corporation, um, began pilfering um, uh, secret documents and he blew the whistle um, on the United States, um, uh, particularly the run up to war and the escalation of the war. Um, and he published what's called the Pentagon Papers. These were published, uh, serialized in the New York Times in 1971. And it's from this kind of activity that newspapers like the New York Times get their reputation as being liberal. Uh, when, whenever somebody yells about the liberal media, they're really talking about, uh, beginning at least, in the Vietnam era, in which uh, the news media stopped supporting the government in the war and, and began reporting on, um, it began propagandizing indeed uh, against the war. Um, when the tide had turned um, against the war, um, at least the loud tide had turned against the war, the newspapers um, promoted uh, withdrawal, they promoted the critique of uh, American society and and earned their reputation as being liberal uh, at that point. Now that moniker has uh, has stayed far. It's, it's long outlived its usefulness. Um, it, it's 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 kind of inappropriate to call the news media liberal anymore in that older sense of the word. Nevertheless, uh, the Pentagon Papers were published uh, in serial form. Uh, by whistleblower Daniel Ellsberg. They were published as a book that is still available. Um, and it really brought the U.S. government into disrepute and lowered the credibility of the war uh, itself. Another um, 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 punch at the, um, at the credibility of the war uh, was a media event staged by uh, the organization Vietnam Veterans Against the War called the Winter Soldier Investigation from January 31st to February 2nd of 1971 that dovetailed with the publication of the Pentagon Papers um, uh, in which um, um, soldiers testified um, about uh, known or about their knowledge of war crimes and about uh, uh, sometimes their participation in war crimes. Uh, this led to a congressional hearing conducted by um, uh, the Fulbright Committee uh, concerning the conduct of the Vietnam War. And this was before the war was over. Um, so this is kind of the apogee of the anti-war movement. Um, the anti-war movement and the new left and the civil rights movements all joined together to promote one another. But by 1968 had uh, changed from critiquing individual components of US policy to offering a radical leftist critique of American society, American economics, American military policy. This opened the door to what uh, scholars have called the rights revolution. And that is, uh, we we see groups who identified themselves as being oppressed by um, American society or oppressed within American society began demanding equal uh, rights and representation. We see this beginning with the the upturn in women's rights in the 1970s with Native American uh, rights activists with Hispanic rights activists, with environmentalists, with gays. Uh, All of these respond by the civil rights, new left, and anti-war movements. Let's look now at uh, uh, some pictures of the anti-war movement you see in the upper left, the November 15, 1969, uh, second anti-war march on Washington at which about 500,000 people participated. And you can see uh, a number of things here, the, um, uh, the V sign, which no longer means victory, but means peace, the, the uh, peace sign uh, there on the black banner. And behind that, um, the, a sign that shows how these movements have merged together in the war and in the poverty uh, simultaneously. 
Uh, the upper right, um, we see probably the most famous picture uh, of the um, um, of the Kent State Massacre. Uh, the young man in the foreground is um, uh, is dead, having been shot. Um, and the, the young woman, of course, decrying this uh, between her knees is a stream of blood going to the curb. This is an extremely well-known image of that uh, tragedy. In the lower left, we see the, um, the change. Like, like we said, in 1968, things started getting violent. And the, um, not so much the anti-war movement, but the, the, the SDS split in 1968, and one of its factions um, became violent, called the Weathermen, and the Weathermen tended to bomb places. Uh, they 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 were criminals. Um, they they were potentially uh, political martyrs, but uh, they engaged in in criminal acts. Uh, sometimes, uh, unfortunately, people were killed in these political acts. I don't mean to use the passive voice. Um, they they killed people. Uh, many times they didn't mean to. Particularly the bombers. Uh, usually just wanted to bomb um, uh, places. Unfortunately, sometimes security guards were um, uh, in the wrong place at the wrong time in one particular instance. Uh, other times, uh, weathermen sometimes attracted uh, criminal elements um, and who would rob banks and sometimes would kill uh, uh, people in the banks or kill police officers. Um, and, and this was a separate issue, but it really did seem like um, uh, the new left had gotten hooked up with uh, lawlessness. Uh, Daniel Ellsberg is the is the fellow with his uh, hand to his chin in the middle there, and John Kerry was part of the Winter Soldier hearings in uh, 1971. Kerry, a um, Vietnam vet against the war, uh, who then uh, became a senator and uh, ran for president in 2004 as the democratic standard bearer. Okay, this ends the lecture on the anti-war movement. And as always, thank you very much.